Welcome to the Jackson Kelly webinar, MSHA Compliance, From Inspection to Litigation. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to address some administrative issues. Because we want to make sure we limit this presentation to no more than 60 minutes, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. For those of you participating from your computer, questions may be submitted using the chat pane located at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical questions during the course of the webinar, you may use the chat pane or send an email to marketing at jacksonkelly.com. The full presentation will be sent to you via a web link. Included in this email will be a link to a voluntary survey. We will use your responses to the survey to plan future webinars and events. All participants' phones have been muted and the presentation is now being recorded. Thank you all for attending. Today's speaker is Arthur Wolfson. Arthur represents mining clients during fatal and non-fatal accident investigations conducted by MSHA and state agencies and conducts training for those clients on the responsibilities under the Mine Act. He represents clients in civil and criminal matters, including defensive enforcement actions arising under federal mine safety and health administration statutes such as administrative and civil litigation and negotiation. Arthur? Thank you, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are located today. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, a couple of caveats about this presentation before I begin. Uh, first of all, since we are limited to 60 minutes, this is a general overview. We're, we're going to cover a lot of ground but certainly not everything that you may encounter in your dealings with MSHA on a day-to-day -day basis. Second caveat is that we have a, a pretty wide diversity of participants today um, covering both coal, metal, non-metal, um, production operators, contractors, even a member of the media, I believe, um, and all over the country, surface underground facility. So this presentation is a bit general. Hopefully uh, you find it applies to what you do, but if it doesn't address a specific uh, uh, coal-related issue or metal, non-metal related issue, uh, that, is, that is the reason. Um, and the third caveat is this is, a, this is a presentation about compliance. I'm an attorney and I represent operators in their compliance efforts. This is not a safety presentation. I am not a safety professional. Obviously, safety comes first in everything you do. Um, but this is about compliance, and I believe we would all agree to some, to, to, to some degree that there is a difference between safety and MSHA compliance. MSHA isn't going away. We all know that. Um, MSHA will be with us uh, and is part of your business. This presentation is really designed to help you um, comply with MSHA and manage your interactions with MSHA to position yourself as best you can in case uh, disagreements with MSHA arise. Um, I titled it from compliance, uh, excuse me, from inspection to litigation, and perhaps a better title would have been from inspection to resolution, because not every disagreement with MSHA results in litigation. Um, a lot of times issues with MSHA compliance are resolved at the site without the need for a contest, without the need for an attorney. Um, other times uh, disputes proceed all the way to a litigation uh, situation before an administrative law judge, all the way up to an appeal before a, a court of appeals. This information is designed to cover all of that. Um, I believe that your compliance efforts, your manage, management of your compliance efforts work best when they begin at the inspection level. And if you sense that disputes may arise or there may be uh, disagreements with MSHA, that you begin your efforts to address those at the inspection level. And those efforts really um, are consistent with what you do all the way up through trying a case in court if it goes that far. Um, so the information that I'm presenting here today is really 
aimed at um, uh, those efforts from the inspection all the way up through if a case needs to be tried before a judge or up on appeal. Obviously, this goes without saying, but the first step in managing your MSHA compliance efforts is not to wait for MSHA. Conduct good examinations, whether they be pre-shifts and on-shifts, pre-ops on uh, equipment, weekly exams, and so forth. Um, fix what you find, fix what's recorded, and make sure that you record when you fix items. I will be mentioning that several times today. It's very important. When something is corrected, please make sure there's a record of it. Um, we'll be talking about interactions with MSHA and taking notes during inspections. Keep accurate and factual notes and maintain them. And lastly, be knowledgeable. Uh, for everyone who's on the call here today, I think uh, this shows a commitment to being knowledgeable. But know the law. Know your resources, know what's out there. Um, that can go a long way in assisting your compliance efforts. This is the most important slide in the entire presentation. If you take one thing away from this hour, please take this away. Information wins cases. Cases are not won by legal gibberish. Cases are not won by lawyer tricks or legal maneuvers. It's not what you see on TV. Our cases are fact-driven, and whoever has the information to support the positions they want to convey should achieve a successful result. This leads into the next piece, which is, well, how do you go about accumulating that information? And that's the part that really starts during the inspection. But before we get into specifics about the inspection, let's talk a little bit more generally as what might help defenses. If you find yourself in a situation where you're disagreeing with MSHA, how do we position ourselves uh, to have the information we need to be successful? And the first thing is let's talk a little bit about the law. The Mine Act, which is the law that um, gives rise to MSHA and all the standards that we're required to follow is what's called a strict liability statute. Strict liability is a legal term that means liability without fault. In the civil litigation world, uh, if, if there's, say, a car accident, the person that's at fault would be liable. The person that's not at fault would not be liable. Uh, the Mine Act is different. As you probably know, any mine operator, even if they've done nothing wrong or didn't have any reason to know, uh, is liable for compliance with all the standards in the 30 CFR that apply to their particular mine, um, which is why we can have citations with, with no negligence, but there still could be a violation. The flip side of the strict liability concept are two important concepts for evaluating enforcement actions, gravity and negligence. Gravity is how serious the violation is. Is it more or less likely to be harmful? Is it significant and substantial? How many people does it affect? And so forth. And negligence is how much fault the operator uh, is at when committing the violation. And as anybody that's ever been a cita issued a citation knows, Citations and orders can vary in terms of gravity and negligence. I go through these two slides because when we're looking for how to defend against MSHA citations, we're really looking at three things. One, is there a violation? And oftentimes there is. Why? Because the Mine Act is a strict liability statute. However, if there is a violation, we can argue, as many of us already know, uh, varying degrees of gravity and negligence. That will impact the heightened enforcement designations such as S&S &S and unwarrantable failure. It will also impact the penalty. So assuming that there, if, there, if the argument is that there's no violation, then the information we're looking, looking to gather is just that. Why is there no violation? 
But assuming that a violation does exist, we can manage our compliance efforts by both um, addressing the negligence or gravity findings. And what we're going to walk through next is what you should be looking for to, to mitigate negligence and gravity findings. Um, I know there's a few attorneys on the line. Uh, those of us that went to law school know that uh, one of the things they teach you in law school, or at least test you on, is what's called issue spotting. And issue spotting is just, just that, what it sounds like. When you're presented with a fact pattern, when you're presented with a situation, can you spot the issues uh, that the situation uh, gives rise to? Um, for those of you who that deal with MSHA, either as escorts or safety personnel uh, making decisions on contesting citations or gathering information, you also need to uh, be able to, uh, to issue spot. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here. What sort of issues do you need to be able to spot to mitigate negligence and gravity findings? And this is not an exhaustive list, but, uh, nor will these issues be present in every case. But this is just some examples of um, uh, some types of issues that, if you're able to spot, might help mitigate a high negligence finding or a finding of negligence higher than you think is appropriate. The so first, did the condition uh, just occur? Um, if it did, uh, negligence should not be high and maybe shouldn't even be moderate. High negligence is new or should have known with no mitigating factors, but if it just occurred, then how would management know of the condition? Second example of a mitigating factor. Was the condition created by an hourly employee without the knowledge of management? Um, those of you that do OSHA work know that this is a defense to an OSHA citation that can result in it being vacated. That's not the case in MSHA. Why? Because it's strict liability. So even if an hourly employee uh, commits a violation without the knowledge of management, there's still a, still a citation. However, it can mitigate the negligence uh, and can be an argument that the negligence should be lower. Um, of course, uh, management is only responsible, uh, or, or I should say the negligence of management should only reflect negligence committed by employees who are, quote, agents of the operator. So an hourly, a rank and file hourly employee is not an agent of the operator. His or her negligence, while still leading to a violation, should not be imputed to the operator. Next example, condition occurred since the last examination, similar to the first one. How is management to know? Again, going back to the first thing I said, keeping good and accurate exam records can help uh, establish this. Condition not obvious. Another good thing to, to be looking for um, to mitigate negligence. A few more on negligence. Area not routinely inspected or traveled. Uh, equipment is not used regularly. Um, the condition is the condition existed for a period of time, but efforts were made to correct it. If efforts were made to correct it and we've documented those efforts, maybe we weren't 100 percent successful, there's still a violation, but it sure is good to know what efforts we've been making to establish mitigating factors. This one you don't see too often, but it's worth thinking about. Um, perhaps you had all, every intention in the world of, of correcting a condition. Um, and had even taken steps to begin that, but then something unavoidable occurred. Mining is a dynamic process. Things happen, and uh, did something occur uh, that you had to address first, and um, were not, uh, that inhibited your ability to correct it. Again, these are all, it, this is all for issue spotting. These are types of arguments we can make if the facts uh, give rise to it, and this is what your escorts and safety personnel should be looking for. A couple more on negligence. Hazard not serious enough to warrant increased attention by the operator. Uh, again, this goes back to the obviousness and extensiveness of the condition. We want to be able to explain why we have this position because MSHA might disagree. They might say, you knew about it. You should have corrected it. And we, 
we need to be able to establish, well, if we prioritized something else first, why did we do that? Um, this is one you have to be a little careful of, but it can be a mitigating factor in the right circumstances. Uh, similar to the uh, one we talked about earlier with the hourly worker, uh, unforeseeable employee misconduct. If we've trained workers and have policies and procedures in place and an employee violates one of those procedures, that can be a mitigating factor against negligence. Not a defense to the violation, there's still a violation, but it can be a, a mitigating factor against negligence. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, actually, I'll put the next two up together. Um, dealing with prior MSHA conduct, um, this is one, if, if MSHA has been in an area before or has observed a condition or practice before and did not cite it, that can be a defense for one of two reasons. Uh, one, uh, it goes to the obviousness of, this, of the condition. If MSHA didn't, didn't observe it, then, then the operator uh, shouldn't be he held to a higher standard than an MSHA inspector. Uh, the other is, um, would a reasonable mine uh, operator recognize this as a violation? And that actually, in some circumstances, can actually be a defense to the citation, resulting in it being vacated on notice grounds. Um, that there's a rather detailed legal test for that, but even if it isn't vacated, it can be the basis for lowering the negligence. These are all issues that I raise to be on the lookout for, that if you find certain citations present any of these uh, mitigating factors, we want to be looking for these because these can help reduce uh, your, your liability. Moving on to gravity findings. Again, gravity is just how serious the citation is. Was it hazardous? Um, did it uh, present a degree of danger? And uh, these are mitigating factors against higher gravity findings. Again, we want our folks to be looking for this stuff and letting us know. Uh, again, you're, you'll see some overlap here. The violation did not exist long. If it did not exist long, there's limited exposure, which is the next one. If there's limited exposure and, and it did not exist for a uh, uh, extended period of time, it's likely not going to be particularly hazardous or expose people to a great degree of danger. Is the likelihood of injury low? And we want to document why. How many ifs before an injury? Um, this is not one of those circumstances that the stars must align in order to uh, give rise to an injury. No, in the course of normal mining operations, what must occur from this uh, particular citation for there to be an injury. This is not theoretical. We want to know what that is. And if it's, if it's too remote, then we need to be on the lookout for that. Do we have redundant protections? Now, MSHA is attempting to argue, at least in the S&S context, that redundant protections, certain redundant protections, shouldn't be considered to mitigate an S&S finding. Um, there's some uh, ongoing litigation about that, uh, the degree to which you can consider redundant protections in S&S. &S. For now, the case law is somewhat split and not altogether clear. But even apart from S&S, &S, uh, redundant protections should be noted in terms of number affected, type of injury, uh, whether it's fatal or lost work days and that, that type of uh, thing, which uh, obviously the degree to which you can lower those findings the better off you are. Finally, we want to know how serious the injury would be. Um, uh, we all know, or I would suspect that most of us have seen MSHA writing uh, nearly all electrical violations, uh, or a good bit of electrical violations, is fatal. Uh, I don't think that's fair, and I'm, I would assume many of you agree with me. Um, if a particular electrical violation if it, uh, should not be written as fatal, if it, if it would likely not result in a fatality for a variety of reasons, we need to know that. We need to know why. We need to know what specifically we're doing to make it so. So these are some of the issues we want to be looking for, again, for both our escorts and safety personnel and also anyone involved in, in this because as, as we're making decisions on how to proceed with citations, um, these are some of the issues that may help us uh, establish some mitigating factors. Um, 
I'm going to move on. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to move on to uh, talking about uh, um, managing a, an inspection. Uh, some practical uh, uh, tips and considerations for managing an inspection. And keeping in mind that slide before, where I said the most important slide was that information wins cases. Well, how do you go about gathering that information? And if you're an escort, or if you manage folks that do escort MSHA, um, the first thing we want to talk about is the tools. Uh, escorts uh, should not go empty-handed. They should have tools to help them gather information. And obviously, the different type of mind that you have will dictate what types of information you're going to gather and the tools you need. But certainly, a tape measure, um, if if a, an inspector is claiming in the coal context that there's an accumulation of combustible material, we want to know uh, how deep, how big, uh, where is it located, how far is it from an ignition source. And if an inspector is going to tell us, well, it was close, um, it would sure help us if we have a measurement to tell us exactly how close. Uh, guarding, how, how was there a gap in the guarding? How big was it? How far was the gap from a moving part? These are just examples. I'm sure you can think of many others. Um, different types of detectors uh, obviously help get us data. Um, uh, gas detectors and those sorts of things get us quantifiable data. Paint chips are great in the, in the, in the cold context for uh, rock dust uh, violations, which um, those of you in, in underground coal mining know you're seeing uh, an increased emphasis on that. Sampling is very good. Uh, if MSHA takes a sample of something, or if MSHA doesn't take a sample of something and claims that something's combustible or otherwise hazardous, if we're able to get a sample of something our, ourselves to uh, um, counter uh, an allegation, that's good. Obviously, a notebook. Uh, we're going to talk more in detail about notes. Cameras are good. P photographs are, are, are very good. Um, uh, you know, remember, if these cases go to court, they may not go to court for a, a, a year, two, or three uh, years, or even longer. Uh, having that photograph to preserve what it actually looked like is very helpful. Heat gun is good anytime you're uh, uh, accused of having an ignition source of any of any sort. Um, it's nice to take a heat reading so we can actually have some examples of what the heat actually is, whether or not it is elevated. And then, of course, anything else. These are just ideas that we see from our clients uh, of information that's been gathered. But we learn new things from our clients every day. So I'm sure there's plenty of tools you, that you all are using that I, ha I haven't listed. But anything that gets you information is good. As we all know, anytime you're issued an MSHA citation, you have to abate it. Uh, you have to take the corrective measures that MSHA says, even if you disagree with it. Again, another difference from OSHA. Um, and oftentimes, you want to get, get it abated as quickly as possible. And that's good. As I said, this, I, this isn't a safety discussion. Anytime you need to correct something safety related, obviously, we need to do that quickly. But one thing is, before uh, abatement measures are taken, uh, very quickly, but uh, we need to make sure this is being done, that the escort or anybody else involved stops, identifies if any of those issues that I discussed or any other issues that might mitigate uh, the violation or the gravity and negligence exist, identify the issues and identify the evidence. Um, after you've identified those issues and collected your information, then proceed with abating the citation. This shouldn't take long. But those few minutes in gathering evidence and evaluating the issues can make all the difference if you plan on contesting the citation later. Um, information gathered after abatement obviously isn't particularly helpful because then you know, the condition no longer exists. Um, what I'm going to present next is, is just a quick example of an escort that did a particularly good job of issue spotting. This is a citation that was issued in an underground coal mine uh, involving a roof bolt that had been struck by a piece of equipment. The inspector 
noted that the roof bolt was painted orange, and he uh, assumed that it had been painted orange uh, by someone to, to give the mine an indication of the damaged bolt. And as a result, he wrote this as an as a unwarrantable failure, a 104D order. Um, the escort did a very nice job and snapped this picture. Uh, this is the roof bolt, uh, at, at, which is painted orange. And what the escort noted was, wait a second, there's no orange paint underneath where the roof bolt or where the roof bolt plate has been struck. And you can see the corner of the plate sort of in the middle that has been struck. And the escort uh, thought to himself, well, if somebody had painted this after it had been struck, there would have been orange paint underneath where the plate was. Uh, makes sense. So this must have been uh, painted before it was struck not giving management any knowledge of a struck plate, and then struck afterwards. Um, this, cita this order actually was, was uh, litigated. It was taken to court. AMSHA would not back off the 104D order. Uh, it was litigated, and in a very short hearing, the escort explained his picture, explained his theory, and the judge dropped the D order. He modified it to a 104A citation. He reduced the negligence from high to moderate and he uh, reduced the penalty significantly. Um, this is just a very quick example of issue spotting of an, of an escort that listened to, the, listened to the inspector, disagreed, uh, spotted the issue, got us the evidence, and uh, made for, quite frankly, a, a relatively simple hearing in order to get the result we wanted. Continuing on with conduct during an inspection and how to best position yourself to gather information, we're going to talk a little bit about taking notes and, and paying attention to the inspector. And notes are very important. Um, they really help us establish, uh, you know, what was going on at the time. Uh, they're contemporaneous, um, and they establish, establish facts. Who was there? What was there? What was seen? If you're taking measurements, you're including that. If you took a photograph, you note that you took a photograph, and so forth. But there's uh, good and better ways of taking notes. Um, and what we want to know is what happened. Uh, what did the inspector do? Where was he or she? What did he or she look at? Um, and concentrate on facts. I always like to say that when I'm reading notes, I prefer to see nouns and verbs rather than adverbs and adjectives because nouns and verbs give me facts. I want to know what happened. Uh, we'll get to the argument later, um, but let, we need to know from the escort the facts. Uh, don't generalize. Again, that's why measurements are so important. Some of this is simple stuff, but the simple stuff can make all the difference. Stating that um, an, uh, an accumulation was was three inches uh, is a lot better than telling me it wasn't that big. Um, the three inches, now I know exactly how big it was. Um, names of witnesses. Um, when a case goes to hearing, if a case goes to hearing, we need to know who the witnesses were. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about hearings later on, but uh, we need to know who was involved. It's very difficult to recreate this stuff a year or two years after the fact. Um, so we need to document who was involved. Inspector comments. Some inspectors themselves editorialize. Um, we need to know that if they do. Nothing's off the record. Um, conversations. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we'd like for our folks to converse with MSHA. But uh, if MSHA is, a, if an inspector is editorializing or or stating something that, frankly, may undermine their case. We need to know that. Quote word for word, if the language is colorful, if the language is something you would not want your kids to hear, that's OK. We need to know that. We've all heard the words before. Please put the words in your notes. Um, we ask that you do not editorialize your comments or opinions. Again, just get us the facts. The arguments will flow from the facts, but what we need, the, what we need is the facts. If a case proceeds to hearing, 
Your notes will be discoverable. That means they will get turned over. I forgot to hit the button. I apologize for talking about editorializing. Um, your your uh, notes will be discoverable. So they will be seen by MSHA if a case pr proceeds to litigation. We see their notes and they see our notes when a case goes to court. Keep that in mind when you're taking notes. If you don't want your thoughts or your opinions to be heard by MSHA, then keep them to yourself and don't put them in notes. Again, documentation is discoverable. Talking next about pictures. Again, as I said before, I really like pictures. I showed you an example of a picture that I like. Uh, but there's some cer certain uh, things to keep in mind when taking pictures. First is document them when you took them. I have had cases in the past where photos were in a file and nobody could remember taking them. Um, it's very hard to get those admitted in court. It's very easy for the other side to attack their credibility. When you don't have somebody who can say, yeah, I took that, it fairly and accurately represents the condition that was cited. Um, it's a lot more difficult if nobody can remember taking them. So document them. You know, your your folks who escort MSHA every day, which I know some of them, some of you, some of you folks out there have that situation, they may not remember having taken a picture. But if they documented that they took the picture, uh, then we'll we'll know that going forward. Document everything about the picture. Where is it? What is it a picture of? Uh, I, one of my clients does a very nice job of putting that information on the back of the picture so that when it's turned over uh, to me and then subsequently if I have to produce it in, in litigation, uh, we can say, look, this is, this is where it was, the time the picture was taken, uh, the, the person that took the picture, which was probably the escort, who was the inspector, where was it, and so forth. And then chain of custody. If these photos are going to get passed from an escort, to a safety director, to an in-house attorney, to an outside attorney, or anyone else. You know, we need to be able to know that just in case there's an attack on the chain of custody. Um, you know, where, where do these photos go? If they're coming directly to counsel, that's great. But if they're not, if they've lived on in a file, if somebody else is responsible for gathering information, um, you know, we need to know, um, you know, what was, uh, you know, where were those photos and what was the chain of custody. Covering a lot of ground here, so I'm going to keep moving. The next thing is communicating with the inspector. Um, again, as I said before, we ask for uh, our folks to gather uh, information and to document when MSHA makes comments, recognize that they will be doing the same thing. Um, we have had cases in the past where our escorts have said things that were not particularly helpful to our case, and those get quoted in the inspector's notes. So recognize that anything you say may, not always, but may be used later in a proceeding by MSHA. May be construed adversely. Um, um, you know, again, similar thing. Uh, do not concede a violation. An escort may or may not have all the facts at the particular moment that a citation is issued to know whether or not there is a violation. If you concede the violation, it's going to be a little difficult later on to argue that there was no violation. We may still be able to, but it doesn't help. If an inspector is pressing you to, to agree with him or her that there was a violation, um, it's, it's best to simply state, well, you don't have all the facts yet. And uh, so you're not going to comment on that. But uh, conceding a violation um, obviously doesn't help us. And do not blame another crew. As I said before, uh, the, the company is uh, the, the, the negligence of, of an agent, any agent of the operator, any foreman or manager is imputed to the company. So even if it's not your crew that uh, perhaps caused a problem, if you want to blame another crew, well, that doesn't particularly help the company. Um, we see a lot of assumptions being made by MSHA inspectors. Um, one particular inspector that I have come across quite a bit um, is fond of saying that, well, in his experience, he can tell that that violation existed for six shifts. I don't know if they teach a, uh, a class like that at the academy or if they have some sort of crystal ball or something that tells an inspector how long something's been there. I think that's an assumption. If an inspector makes that type of assumption, we need to document it. And we need to document 
that it is an assumption. And if we have facts to counter that, we need to start gathering those facts because those assumptions are, are what are going to give rise to the gravity and negligence cita uh, designations in a citation. Um, we also need to not be afraid to point out when they are making an assumption and to disagree. Obviously, respectfully and professionally, as I said, what you state might end up in um, an inspector's notes. But you know what? If, a, if it ends up in inspector's notes that you disagree, that's a good thing. And I have seen that, where uh, an escort respectfully disagrees and the inspector put, so-and-so company escort disagree. That's terrific. Uh, and more to the point, it should always be in your notes if you disagree. And if you told the inspector that you disagreed, even if he or she doesn't put it in, in their notes, it should go in your notes that you told them you disagree. Um, those of you who have been to a hearing will, will smile when I say this. Uh, at a hearing, we are, the inspector is always asked by the government attorney, did the company present any, any mitigating factors? And invariably, even if mitigating factors were presented, the inspector will always say, or most always say, no, they didn't present any. So if you're able to document, yes, you did present mitigating factors and you disagreed at the time of inspection, it helps our case a great deal. The next slide is a little bit of levity for this point in the presentation, but these are all statements we have seen at various times, actual statements that have been made to inspectors um, that are not particularly helpful, at least for their own sake. You know, if you look at the last one, well, that's the way we've always done it. If that's your defense, that's the way we've always done it, that's not so good. But if you're able to say, well, it's been like this, MSHA's been through here, they've never cited this before, this is the way every mine in, you know, that does our type of mining does things as an industry practice, that's helpful. But simply to say, well, this is the way we've always done it, not so helpful. MSHA inspectors vary in all shapes and sizes, levels of experience, and some of them are, are straightforward with you, um, and some of them are not. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to prepare for those who are not straightforward with us and are sometimes trying to trap our personnel and escorts. And other times, even if MSHA is not trying to uh, 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 lay any sort of trap, situations arise where our escorts trap themselves. So we need to be, we need to be mindful of this and, uh, e and educating our escorts so as not to walk into a trap or not to create a trap that can, can inhibit our case. Uh, some of the traps filling the conversational vacuum. Uh, some folks, not everybody, but some people, um, uh, find it awkward if there's silence. So you're escorting uh, an MSHA inspector, you're with that inspector the whole day, you run out of things to talk about, and there's silence. And uh, particularly for the extroverts out there, um, you find this uncomfortable and you find the need to just start talking. Uh, if you are one of those people and find the need to just start talking, uh, don't talk about the inspection. Um, do not start uh, offering up information about the mine. Talk about sports. Talk about uh, what you did over the weekend or whatever. Be, you know, be friendly. But uh, avoid talking about the inspection because that just leads to opening up uh, information uh, that wasn't even asked for. The second thing is if, if our folks are making assumptions, we don't want to do that. If you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have to know how long something's been uh, existing the way it's been that way, then, then, then don't assume. Um, we walk ourselves into problems there uh, when, we, when, when, when we start making assumptions. Similarly, wanting to appear knowledgeable when you lack direct information, um, you know, that sort of goes without saying. If you don't have the direct information, you don't want to be offering up in, uh, assumptions uh, when you don't have the facts. Another trap is not being assertive. Just because MSHA says something doesn't make it so. Um, if you disagree, you know, you know your minds better than MSHA does. 
if you disagree with something, again, make sure that's stated um, respectfully and professionally, even if the inspector is not being professional. Um, simply state respectfully that you disagree. And note that uh, in your notes. I'm not listening to questions. Um, you know, this one, it sounds almost silly, but it does happen. People don't listen to a question. They respond to a question. I had a case once where a mine manager was asked by an MSHA inspector, do you allow travel on unburned roadways? I don't know what this manager thought the question was, but he obviously thought it was something different because his answer was yes. Now, for one, that mine did not allow travel on unburned roadways. And two, even if they did, what manager is ever going to answer yes to that question? What happened is, is the manager didn't listen to the question. That's an extreme example, but it's, an, it's a real example. And that resulted in a D order and a 110C proceeding against the manager. Could have been avoided if he had listened to the question. If you answer the question, your answer will likely be recorded in the inspector's notes, and that's going to live on. And as I said before, if these cases don't go to hearing for a year or two after the fact, that answer lives on in the, in the inspector's notes. It lives on in the file. And then the last thing is another trap answering more than the questions asked. Uh, again, volunteering information um, that is not being asked is not always helpful, unless it's in the context context of disagreeing and being assertive. And that leads to this point, as we've stated, be objective, explain your position, and we're looking for physical evidence. Documents, um, as many of you know, MSHA, MSHA has, has always requested certain documents. Uh, we're seeing more and more of them requesting even more documents. Um, and how to manage document requests is a, is a, is a very broad topic. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into that in full in this, in, this, in this hour. But if you are presented with a document request and find yourself in a position that you have to present, pr produce documents to MSHA, we want to make sure our documents are good. Uh, that includes our exam records and any other records we're producing at the time of the inspection and also information we have to produce in discovery if a case is going to hearing. With that in mind, here's some just brief rules of thumb on documents. Prepare every document as though it will be reviewed by someone in litigation, because it most likely will be. Um, the next one, well, you know, if, if it's something you're, you're proud of and stand by, great. Uh, if it's not, you know, well, we want to avoid that. Um, consistency is critical. Uh, nothing makes an opposing attorney's job easier than if one document says one thing and another document says another thing. And again, don't speculate or reach premature conclusions. Um, as we've said, um, information and documents are discoverable when a case goes to hearing. And if items get written down, then we end up living with, with what's said. What's next are a couple of examples of some forms that had to be produced after a mine had made the decision to contest certain citations. And you know these types of documents now make um, uh, a contest of these citations somewhat difficult. Um, stands to reason why. Um, do you agree with the condition as it was explained? Yes, I agree. Well, it's going to be kind of difficult to contest that now. If you're an escort and a citation was issued, and it was a good citation, and the inspector got it right, and, and the mine just happened to have a bad day, it is better to not put that in a document and simply go to your safety manager and tell them, well, we probably don't want to contest this one. Putting hurtful or harmful information in a document simply doesn't help us. Uh, the safety manager may know something you don't. He may, he or she may make the decision to contest the citation on other grounds. But something like this, just an example, and here's another one, um, has to be produced to uh, MSHA if the case is in litigation. So keep that in mind when you're creating documents. We love facts. We love information. But if something's going to be put down on a document that is harmful to our case, that will have to be produced. 
moving on into somewhat of the, the litigation context, litigation issues. Um, as I said uh, several times now, that documents have to be produced for MSHA. There are two generally, and this is a very general overview of privilege on documents and communication. Um, there are two general privileges that, that an operator can enjoy to not have to produce information. Uh, the first is attorney-client communication. Uh, if a mine operator calls their attorney, uh, including their in-house attorney, uh, and conveys information to the attorney um, through email or a phone call or a memo, uh, that, is, that document, that information is not disclosed. Anything that exists between an attorney and client is privileged. Um, the other um, privilege that we enjoy is called attorney work product privilege. If, if, if I or another attorney uh, goes to a mine site and conducts interviews and then I write a memo of those interviews to the file, my memo is not produced. Um, similarly, if, if I direct another person, even if that other person is not an attorney, to go conduct interviews or investigate a matter in my direction, and that person does so and, and takes notes and, and sends those notes to me or writes a memo and, and sends that memo to me, it's as if I did it. They stand in my shoes. So those documents um, uh, do not need to be produced. But the key is that is for the work product privilege that is done either by the attorney or, or at the direction of, attorney, of the attorney and then is given to the attorney. Um, it's not enough to simply state uh, attorney-client privilege or attorney work product privilege on a document and then widely distribute the document because once that document is used for other purposes, the privilege is lost. Um, so if we want to protect notes and information and documents from uh, disclosure, um, uh, it needs to fall under one of those privileges, attorney-client communication or work product either by the attorney or at the direction of the attorney. Um, yeah, this language comes directly from a judge's order. Uh, uh, notes taken during and shortly after the inspection that contain factual information are not privileged and must be disclosed. Again, you cannot have escorts take notes and then at a later point set, state, well, it's attorney-client privilege. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, if, it's, if it's taken during uh, an inspection, it's going to be produced to MSHA. Um, if the case goes to litigation, it's going to pr be produced to MSHA in the litigation context if it goes to litigation. Um, and attorneys are bound by, by these rules as an ethical matter. So um, yeah, that, that's, there's not a lot of choice in the matter. Another issue we see in litigation is preservation of evidence. Um, if you know you're going to contest a particular citation, you have a duty to preserve evidence related to that citation. I know that some exam records are only required to be kept for certain periods of time, a year on some, uh, even less than that on others. Um, but if you know a case is going to go to litigation, we need to make sure those records are being preserved, they're not being thrown away just because the year is up. Um, the duty to preserve evidence attaches when the party uh, knows that it might be relevant to future litigation. And if a citation is contested, we need to make sure we are preserving evidence. Um, the next issue we see in, in litigation is what's called spoliation of evidence. Um, if it is found that a, that a party um, either uh, uh, willfully or, or knew or should have known uh, that certain evidence should have been protected and, and, did, and willfully did not produce, uh, take the steps necessary or, or was negligent in not taking the steps necessary to uh, preserve that evidence, uh, it can really ruin a case. Uh, there can be sanctions for spo spoliation. Uh, adverse inferences can be drawn, um, such as if we say, if we're trying to argue, well, a condition didn't exist for as long as MSHA believes it did, but we don't have the exam records to show that, uh, the judge can actually infer, well, you would have kept those if it would have proven your point, and you didn't, uh, so I'm going to infer that uh, the condition did exist for as long as MSHA thought it was. Um, 
Other sanctions uh, are listed there. The point is, is that we need to preserve evidence. Um, examples from some case law, here's a, a, a case, Dynamic Energy, uh, where the, the judge drew an adverse inference for spoliation when certain exam records were not retained. And then even if a judge, whoops, forgot to switch that one. Even if a judge um, did not uh, issue actual sanctions, this case, this Consol case, provides a good example of what can happen when, when evidence is not retained or when we don't have the information we need to go to a hearing. Uh, the ALJ did not impose sanctions. He said, well, that's harsh. You know, I, I don't need to do that. However, I'm being asked to decide a case on the record that's before me. And uh, uh, the, the, the case doesn't include the information that the uh, operator says would be helpful. I can't really consider information that isn't present. So uh, he upheld the uh, unwarrantable failure in SNS findings in this particular case. So even if we don't get to a spoliation situation, um, you know, it, it's just harmful to the case if we don't have the information. And that was the result of that case. Again, I said it's the most important slide in the, in the uh, presentation, information wins cases. Shifting gears quickly here before we wrap up to what types of information we want to uh, be prepared to present if we do go to a hearing. Keep in mind if you go to a hearing, it's going to be before what's called an administrative law judge. The administrative law judge is a specialty judge, federal judge that only hears certain types of cases. In this, in this uh, context, mine safety cases, judges before the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission. These judges have heard uh, mining terms before. They know what in-by and out-by means. They know what a berm is. Um, they know what a high wall is and so forth. Um, but mines are very different. Uh, surface, underground, different products, different types of mines, and facilities especially uh, can be very specialized. You should be prepared to present information about your mine layout and mining processes. Again, the objective evidence hopefully we've gathered in the ins yeah, during the inspection. Uh, maps are great. Um, give, give a sense of scale. Photographs I've talked about. And objective data, numbers, sample results, measurements. These types of things are very, very helpful in making your case. Witnesses, direct evidence is the best. Who was there? If we need a witness testimony, it is best to have the person who, who observed the condition or was involved in the practice actually testify. Uh, hearsay is, is admissible in these, con in, in, in these hearings, but they are, it is often afforded less weight than direct information. And some last things about presenting, proceeding to a uh, hearing. Um, I took this first point from an article written by uh, one of the administrative law judges, Judge Manning, uh, that he wrote a few years ago about uh, how to present a case. And Judge Manning's comment was, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. Um, again, these cases are fact-driven. If you have the facts and you're not making assumptions, you can usually point to the simple answer. Um, point the judge in the direction you want him or her to go. Don't leave that up to their imagination. And lastly, build a factual record. If a case goes up on appeal, you don't get another chance on appeal to reopen the factual record. You're only arguing whether the judge made legal errors or whether the, the conclusions were not supported by substantial evidence. But that record that you build before the judge is what's going to live on on appeal. And before we get to questions, because we have a few minutes left, I'm just going to read you uh, a, a, a small portion of the article, that article that I referenced before that Judge Manning wrote, uh, to really hopefully highlight and bring this all together. As to what types of information we're looking for and arguments we're looking for. Uh, judge Manning wrote in this article, the judge will want to know why this case is being presented to him or her for a decision. All of your evidence should be introduced to present the facts to support your thesis that the citation should be vacated or modified. When thinking about the, your case, try to put yourself in the judge's shoes. What facts would you want to know if you were being asked to decide this case? I generally find that the simplest answer to a question is usually the correct one. 
in a factually contested case, if one party's evidence is confusing and difficult to follow, while the other side presents evidence that is coherent and logical, I am more likely to credit the coherent evidence. Try to keep your evidence as clear and easy to follow as possible. You do not want the judge to have to think too hard in order to find in your favor. That concludes the presentation. Um, again, hopefully, uh, what, is, what, what is apparent to you is that your efforts uh, to, to manage your inspections and gather information to, to contest citations begins at the inspection stage, and those same efforts continue all the way up through the hearing. Um, I believe we have about five minutes for questions. Um, um, and we do have one question. If you, there's other questions, um, <clears throat> feel free to type them in now. If a good question came in, can individuals' notes, I'm assuming escorts' notes, be redacted as MSHA can? That's an excellent question. The short answer to that is that operators generally do not enjoy the same privileges to redact notes as MSHA does. As some of you who have seen MSHA notes that have been redacted often redact names and other identifying characteristics of, of minors. Um, there are two um, privileges, well really one that MSHA enjoys, which is what's called an informer's privilege. Uh, if a minor gives information to MSHA, um, um, the, the, the name or any other identifying characteristic of that person um, should, uh, may be redacted. There's also a witness privilege that if a case is in litigation, um, the name of an hourly minor who may testify in a hearing uh, doesn't have to be disclosed until two days before a hearing. But, I, I, but that's not usually what MSHA does. That's what the, that's what the MSHA's attorneys do uh, in, in litigation. Um, MSHA enjoys that privilege by rule, by the commission's rules, by the review commission's rules. Um, there is no such rule for an operator to redact names. Now, having said that, if there is particularly sensitive information that a mine does not want to produce to MSHA, um, payroll information, somebody's social security number, that type of thing. I would advise that at least initially, you may redact, you may want to redact that before pr producing something to MSHA, either in a document request or in the litigation context. But be very careful about that, because r recognize that is not a, a, a statutory or rule-based privilege that you enjoy. It would simply be uh, the manner in which you're producing the document. MSHA might object to that, or if it's in a litigation context, uh, the, uh, the, the attorney might object to that, in which case, if there's an actual dispute over whether certain types of information can be redacted, such as a social security number or something like that, um, uh, that issue might have to go before a judge, and the judge might find one way or another. So uh, the short answer is, is, is no. Um, we, we don't enjoy the same privileges as them should redact information. The long answer is, in managing a document request, you may attempt to, to redact certain information. Recognize that MSHA may end up uh, pursuing that information, and that issue may go before a judge. Um, if, that in, if that answer is, is, is not clear you know, to the person that, that uh, asked, it, please feel free to email me later. My, emails on here or give me a call and we can talk about it um, because I do want you to be careful if you're thinking of that certain information uh, you don't want to share with MSHA because that can lead to bigger issues. So, But a very, very good question. La one more thing let me say about that and then I'll see if we have any more questions is, is I do find that MSHA takes sort of an overly uh, liberal use of the privileges they enjoy. So sometimes MSHA redacts information and frankly they shouldn't be. So if, if you think they're redacting certain information and it goes beyond the scope of those privileges, then uh, um, you should have a conversation with your attorney about it or with MSHA. Uh, I think another question has come in. 
We'll get that in a second. Doctor, I'll just ask you the question. Okay. Are behavior-based observations performed by other employees discoverable? Um, behavior-based. I'm assuming we're we're talking about some of the behavior-based safety plans. Um, it depends, not to give a lawyer answer, <laughs> but it depends. Uh, it depends if it's relevant to the, the citation. Um, if we're talking about a particular practice um, that has been cited and uh, the behavior-based safety plan and the training and that type of uh, thing is, is directly relevant, uh, if observations in some of these behavior-based safety plans uh, speak directly to, the, to a cited condition or practice, yes. They, they would be, which is why when you're documenting some of these, um, uh, when you're engaging in some of these behavior-based safety uh, plans, you need to be mindful of that. Again, I go back to the first thing I said, which is safety comes first. If you, if you believe that uh, behavior-based observations are a good safety practice, by all means, do them. I don't ever want to tell anybody not to do something they believe would enhance safety solely because it might hurt in litigation. Um, if it does, we'll deal with that. But uh, yes, documentation that goes to particular practice uh, or condition um, that's, that's, that's part of one of these programs may very well be litigation, something you want to consider when setting those types of uh, systems up. All right, well, thank you, Arthur, and thank you all for participating. We hope that you'll join us again in the future. To exit the webinar, simply click the exit button.